Yeah, my project is um, aiming to use machine learning to predict hospital admissions for um, respiratory conditions and, and also length of stay. So first question, why? Um, because pre-COVID hospital winter pressure is almost exclusively uh, respiratory conditions. This is this is bed demand, beds in use from respiratory conditions pre-COVID, uh, really obvious winter spikes. COVID obviously changed everything. We've had two winters where we've not had the usual uh, spikes in, in flu and pneumonia. Um, and yeah, we've shown before that actually the, the, the increase in total beds uh, uh, used in winter can be almost completely explained by um, uh, beds in use by uh, older people over 65s who have a longer length of stay with respiratory conditions. And that affects uh, the hospital all the way throughout. This is, this is an example of all types for our performance over the long term. Real seasonal pattern with, with worse performance in the, in the winter over a, uh, a downward trend. Uh, COVID actually made performance improve at first when there was um, far fewer attendances and, and, and lots more empty beds. Um, but then uh, after a year or so, uh, performance has worsened and in summer 22 uh, uh, England ED performance is, is uh, in the summer worse than it's ever been in the worst winter so if as some people in the news this morning are, are fearing this winter we get the re-emergence re of flu and pneumonia and have a bad winter potentially on top of Covid uh, then we'll be in a very challenged position. So there are some known primary care interventions which can potentially avoid some of these admissions so um, uh, but if you've only got limited resources, you've got to know uh, where best to focus um, those interventions. And we did in 2020 work with an MSc student in, uh, from Lancaster University, uh, beginning to have a look at um, from the information you know in primary care about patients, how might you best target um, the ones who potentially are going to get admitted uh, and stay a long time. And this project aimed to um, extend that work. Uh, so excuses first off, <laughs> time constraints, work and domestic meant I've done far less on this so far than I uh, than I intended, hoping to develop it more. But I've done very limited uh, literature search and stakeholder engagement. And as you'll see, done less, less modeling than intended, but it's been, been useful um, preparatory work. Few other challenges, um, one of which is that because this is a, a preventative uh, type of, of model than a diagnostic one, any interventions that are already uh, happening or ones that are proposed would, would change the model, which, which um, gives you challenges around, around interpretation. So for instance, if there's already interventions targeting people with uh, on the COPD register, um, you might think, oh, that they aren't, um, not many of those are being admitted, we don't need to focus on them, whereas, whereas in fact, what you're seeing is that, is that current interventions are working well. There's also extreme um, uh, ethical issues to take into account. Whenever you're targeting anything, you are essentially rationing care. So there's, there's um, ethical questions around that, particularly about um, equity and uh, the dangers of, of machine learning models embedding any current bias. So we'd have to be careful of that for any deployment. And particularly um, using neural network models in particular, uh, rather a black box. So as, as Dan explained, so the limited explainability also um, will give you potential challenges around um, showing that you're not um, proposing an inequitable solution. Uh, various information governance challenges as well. We're quite restricted on how we can we can link and use primary and secondary care data to explain. There are potentially some other data sets um, which which might also be useful, uh, but I've not had time to to investigate those. Big challenge around the data is, as I said, COVID changed everything. So, because I'm looking at uh, non-COVID um, admissions, I'm looking back to um, admissions in 1920, uh, and frustratingly, because our primary care, we're only allowed to keep a snapshot of the data. We've only actually got data for patients who are alive now. So the model currently is actually predicting people who would have been admitted in 1920 and then survived another three years. Um, so um, that's that's a, a, a big limitation of the current model, but um, it can be, can be changed when we get more recent data. Um, also, um, there's an issue in that the long-term condition flags are actually as of now, so um, you're actually maybe put on a register after the admission, not, not before. Uh, there might be a way around that, but again, not had time to implement that. So as I say, this has largely been a learning exercise for me now um, to be able to, to do this um, in more depth um, when we get more recent data from this winter. Learned lots of things about actually um, setting the model and, and doing some machine learning and how to present some of the results. This is just the first step was um, replicating a, a logistic regression uh, model, which has the benefit of uh, much better explainability. 
and also helps to uh, deal with features that are closely correlated. So for instance, if you just do a simple tabulation of the data, some things you'd expect, like if you're on a COPD register, or, or um, if you're aged over 90, you're, you're more likely to be admitted. But there's some other things in there that, that may be a bit of a surprise and also some things that aren't in that top list that you might expect. Whereas if you do a um, logistic regression, it takes the things into account together. So confirm some things. So if you are on the COPD register, you're five times as likely to be admitted, everything else being equal as you will be otherwise, age 90, uh, three times as. And then asthma, which was way down here, if you just do a simple tabulation, uh, where you take into account age and everything at the same time, um, you can see, as you would expect, more likely to be admitted for a respiratory condition. Um, learning disability mental health quite high here. It was initially surprised to me, but I think that's to do with Down syndrome. Um, and also on this model, deprivation wasn't in... Um, that you wouldn't, just from doing a basic tabulation, you wouldn't think deprivation was that important. But when you do a, a logistic regression, you can see actually that... 60% um, increased chance of admission if you live in the most deprived 10% of the country as the least deprived. Um, so because that interacts with age and so on, that doesn't show up so easily if you just do a basic tabulation. So some work on, on creating neural networks. Um, one of the points is that um, it's a very imbalanced data set. So as um, as Dan mentioned, uh, that gives you some challenges. So uh, experimenting with, with techniques, um, because I've got a very large data set, I was able to use undersampling to um, um, to produce a data set where 5% where of the people were admitted uh, rather than just 1%, which, which gave me the best trade-off uh, between precision and recall um, in, um, in, in doing the model. And with very, very little um, optimization, um, the neural network without telling it anything, just giving it the same features as the logistic regression, um, produced pretty much identical results, which was a, a, a positive start. It didn't better the logistic regression, but I think that's because all my features are uh, trues or falses, binary features. So uh, there's a limited chance for the neural network to, to outperform the logistic regression. So as I explained, uh, uh, less than 1% of the um, of the people in the, in the test data set were admitted. So accuracy, as Dan said, isn't very useful. You could get 99% accuracy just by saying nobody gets admitted. Um, this is, a, Dan showed a, a rock curve. So it shows that even my first basic model uh, is considerably better than just tossing a coin, um, but it's not great performance. But one of the challenges of these uh, rock curves is they're not particularly easy to interpret. So this is an alternative way of uh, presenting the results that I think would be more useful uh, if you were actually aiming to target interventions. And thanks to Stephen Ashmead, another one of the um, HMSAs who had a, a similar sort of chart. Um, this is slightly different. This is this is cumulative, but this is saying if you if you target a certain percentage of patients, um, what would be the proportion admitted? So, for instance, if in this size of data set you targeted your top top five thousand um, according to the scores that the model gave. Uh, Ten percent of those in the test data set were actually admitted, as opposed to less than one percent of the um, of the whole population. So, the, the model's doing something in terms of prediction, but because we've given it a very limited feature set, um, not not as much as as I would like it to. <laughs> so, lots more work I'd like to do. Mainly putting more features in, not just binary features. Uh, give the give the neural network chance to do to do more. I've not yet actually use the models to predict length of stay, which is a critical thing. Uh, normal risk stratification is generally just the chance of admission, doesn't take into account the length of stay, which really affects the uh, the impact of the hospital due to, due to bed demand. Um, I'd like to use uh, various methods to try and understand if the neural network does outperform the logistic regression, which features are actually contributing to that. So you could perhaps do a hybrid model where the neural network would suggest things that you could build into your uh, logistic regression to um, maintain some of that explainability uh, while getting the extra power and crucially using uh, more detailed uh, care history of prediction and, and one of the thoughts further down the line is this is a, um, a theograph so this is a human readable form of a, a, a patient's uh, interaction with different care settings uh, primary secondary and other care I'm imagining as um, making a much simplified version of that um, for each patient um, and then using the kind of neural networks that recognize images, see if it could detect patterns in that, um, in that history. Uh, so for instance, you know, it could be that a series of, of short admissions tend to, to uh, precede a, a long admission. So uh, that would be the, 
further down the line. Um, I was also asked just to mention a few other side projects I'd done um, using some of the techniques from the course. This is a bit of um, using network analysis. Um, this is just something just showing ward moves. So you can you can look at all the ward moves in a particular year and see which uh, where moves were from, from one ward to another. Um, so that's been useful. And other people are going to talk about queuing problems. Yeah, this is just an example of looking at um, number of patients in a ED department at a point in time, pre-COVID and post-COVID. So you can see these departments far, far busier, far more people in the department at any point in the week than there were pre-COVID. And that's even though actually attendances were only a very little bit higher. And if you look at the average congestion over time, you can see how it grows and grows and grows. So uh, onset of COVID departments were very quiet. This department had an average about 19 people in the department. Um, it increases very, very slowly, less than one, one patient a week. Uh, but over 18 months, you end up with a department that's um, that's four times as congested. So that's just the point that other people will make in the previous presentation did about if you've got a, a system which doesn't have the capacity to deal with arrivals, then even a small deficit can lead to, to gradually increasing queues. So thank you very much.